human people to carry out wet food, dry food, yeah, as yeah. we have been responsible for many defectors having the reason to go to America. Secondly, the removal of wet food, dry food makes it harder for immigrants in, to stay in America, especially in the new age of the Trump administration. Opening government had the burden to prove two things in this debate, which we don't think they were able to prove in the previous speech. One, Cuban-US relationships benefit America greatly enough for us to put aside our po foreign policy in yeah, order to yeah. get some benefit towards our American economy and American people. But secondly, they had to prove why it's beneficial towards Cuban people, which I do not think they were able to prove as of the Prime Minister. All they told us was this opens up the economy and allows us to maintain better relationships with them. All this we think it does in opening opposition is give them more power over their people. An yeah, open yeah. economy to maintain a tyrant radical regime to control its individuals. To that, I have three responses to its opening government. Firstly, do we need to maintain US-Cuban relationships? There are two reasons to this. We need trade. We have had decades of embargo with Cuba. We think we can rely on, like, we don't need the support of Cuba to maintain yeah. any benefits towards America. I don't think that's a big part Mr. of the debate. Have a seat. But then they said it's good for maintaining better relations, right? Because we can pacify Cuba. So Cuba is a strong ally of Russia yeah. as well, which is another reason why a lot of our embargoes yeah. haven't been creating positive change within the pressure that we create and the damage to their reputation, forcing people to leave Cuba. The reduction of manpower on our side is the best version of harm towards the Cuban administration, sure. the best incentive for individuals yeah. to stand up sure. in a political opposition. Have a seat, then it will ever come. Opening government has the burden to prove why feeding them money, giving them an, a beneficial economy will allow them to open up instead of oppress its people more. What, to that, what does opening opposition support in this debate? We support sure. having up hostility against a nation that has restricted political freedom and has clamped down on political opposition. We'll maintain sanctions that we have done yeah. for decades to ensure that there is more reason to stand up against Cuba. Your clarification. Yeah, we're not having a discussion about whether or not we want to continue sanctions or not normalize relationship with Cuba. Talk about the actual policy of wet food, dry food, and actually have this debate. Okay, so it's an extension of the principle of wet food, dry food <laughs> yeah. is an integral policy or prime minister told us it was an antagonistic policy towards Cuban relations if it is an antagonistic policy then I was also defending not normalizing those relationships you can't say that it's an offense towards Cuba and at the same time say opposition has to defend normalizing relationships with Cuba I want to make two arguments firstly what are the motives behind this policy and why we go into the Cuban people and secondly why is it especially important in the age of Trump. So firstly, what are the motives of this policy? After the failed revolution, after the failed Bay of Pigs revolution, which the CIA was complicit in, by the way, where we actively trained Cuban rebels to fight against the Fidel Castro regime and cause the downfall of the political opposition within Cuba, it led to mass clamping down of political opposition and the creation of mass defectors, and which was facilitated by wet food, dry food policy by America. We took responsibility for the fact that the Cuban, Cuban government was clamping down on its people, we needed to protect people that were running away from the political oppression that this side of the house is complicit in. The only problem now is, in name of solidarity, they would like to remove this policy even though we are turning a blind eye onto thousands of Cubans which were responsible for creating that, which were responsible in creating that political oppression. We think we owe it to the Cuban people to protect them, to accept as many Cuban people as possible. Even if they're trying to clamp down on travel, we'll find a way to ensure more and more people can leave these areas, to ensure more and more people can leave Cuba to get that better life. It was even telling in America when we were waiting on the beaches of Miami to accept more and more Cuban refugees onto our borders to ensure more and more people were being given protection. Side of yeah. the opening government would rid, would rid themselves of this complicity, have a seat. They would try to prove that we don't have this obligation towards the people, that we don't have to ensure their protection, even though we were complicit in the very harm and the reasons why they had to find a better country to live in, the reasons why they had to find a better country to stay. Which brings me to opening government's case. 
their claim is these sanctions don't do anything. All it does is just hardens Cuba. Yeah, it makes yeah. them less tolerant towards America. We think it does a lot of things. It reduces their power over people. Yeah, a reduction right. in trade means lesser money for Cuba, lesser money that goes into authority, lesser money that goes into governance. It reduces the strength of the infrastructure and governance within Cuba. Then it's lesser ability for them to oppress people by the police officers that have money and, and funding of America under your side. Lesser ability to clamp down on opposition because America opened up its trade and removed its embargo and did not try to normalize relations with them. Giving them money is complicity in the oppression of people when we would inspire opposition and opposition only happens when you isolate them as far as possible and ensure that their dependency brings them their downfall, especially towards America. So given the opening government cannot prove that they have been pacified and opening up has made any change in this circumstance, we would rather remove the support from Cuba. Have a seat. Secondly, why is it especially uh, beneficial to refugees now? They try to push it off. They said, you know, you can apply to stay in America. You can take the normal process of staying in America, especially under Trump's administration, where immigration laws are tightened. We're having mass deportation, yeah. and they even mobilized the National Guard to ensure that they were able to deport undocumented refugees. Have a seat. Under your, under in your world, also they were Trump was willing to abolish sanctuary cities, which were safe havens for individuals that are undocumented. In a world of Trump, there is no safe way towards a permanent residentship or a safe way towards an American citizenship. But wet food, dry food does guarantee that for Cuban re Cuban refugees and for people who are in need of a home, especially under Trump's administration, there is no guarantee of safety. For Cuban refugees and people who are who need to uh, to flee Cuba to find better uh, to find to find a better life, it is the best version of protection because it cuts past all the bureaucracy that Trump isn't able to map out. He isn't able to mobilize the national guard to deport these people. He isn't able to deport people on the grounds of not being undocumented. Because wet food, dry food guarantees these people a safe path into becoming American citizens, one which Trump can't opt out of and one which Trump can't make out. And given this, it is especially hard for Cuban refugees to stay in America, they will protect themselves in, in this country because they are likely to be deported under side opening government. So what have I told you? It is clear that Cuba is oppressing its people under the situation. Whether we're willing to feed them that money and the power to continue that oppression and put fuel money into authority that endangers its own people is, is what opening government we're willing to defend. We would stand and fight against these people. We would ensure they get a safe a lot of lofty rhetoric from the leader of opposition when this
The wet foot dry foot policy was born of a time of necessity. And a necessity, that is, the waves of Cuban refugees landing on the shores of Florida due to our own botched up invasion of Cuba. That necessity has disappeared. Let us not let that responsibility disappear. Before we move on, a few clarifications. Last time I checked, the motion was this house celebrates the end of the wet foot dry foot policy and side of opposition was supposed to defend the existence of that policy. Not that we are supposed to defend whether it's better for Trump to repeal the policy or for Obama to repeal the policy. Yeah, yeah. We don't think it's very plausible and reasonable to expect this Change. to defend yeah. all of the benefits, all the harms of the wet foot dry policy, but just nuance it or why is it better for Trump to repeal it? Why is it better for Obama to repeal it? <laughs> this debate is simple, whether we want a policy or not. And this, this, and this characterization of why is it a delicate political mover by Obama is a lie, right? Because we don't think this deal was done in accordance with Trump's election. This is in line with Obama's policy of normalization of relationship with Cuba, and this was just another step of normalization. First step was the first step was uh, visiting them, then they had this and then this fight going on. Now this removal of this policy has nothing to do with Trump. Stop making a different debate. So next move on to a few things that opening government talks about, right? First of all, they PM, PM came out and talked about a lot of things. But the premise of our argument was simple. Our premise of argument was whether normalization was good. And this is where we don't understand why suddenly Deputy Prime Minister Kamala had this huge rant about why this is not about normalization, right? Because all of the arguments, literally, how we open up the economy, how we have better immigration, how we better international relations, are all the benefits of normalization in the first place. So I don't think it's unfair for us to have that discussion, right? And then we told you that it is not true that simply because you open up the economy, suddenly these people will, be, will become very friendly and very, uh, very nice to this great imperialistic nation that you call enemy for 60 years, right? The Russian influence in the world hasn't disappeared. All the, yeah, yeah. all the harm in your world and all the political clamping down has not disappeared. In fact, we argue not have a seat. In fact, we argue in your world, when you effectively remove the punishment, this, the previous leaders will be more emboldened. They have more funds. They have more influence. And uh, we understand that the funds will be funded to the top. But the combat, what's the comparative? In your world, when you open up in the economy and other and all this and money. more money goes to the economy, more money gets funded to the top. The police has more funds to carry out and coming out. Have a seat. The, 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 the intellectual elite has more, the, the human revolution, the human leaders have more capacity to strengthen their power. And that's not what we want, right? Because this is where why Chishan said went totally unresponded. He told you a couple of things. He told you why we're responsible for the current predicament that Cuba is in. He told us that the Cuban leadership hasn't changed from the authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, and therefore we shouldn't further empower them to carry out the harm that they did. And they didn't respond to any of that, right? Any of that. What did they say? Have a seat. They told us that it is they told, they told us that. It's not reasonable for us to expect all Cubans to leave. This is a strong misread, right? We didn't say that we want all Cubans to leave. They say Cubans who want to leave should be allowed to leave. This is where, and this is where they came out this very nice contradiction. In Yahoo, on one hand, they say allowing Cubans to leave will piss off the Cuban leaders, will make them climb up this walls. And on one hand, you'll facilitate asylum. Yeah. They'll make sure that people who want to leave can leave. You cannot have your cake and eat at the same time. Yeah. You need to choose whether you want all Cubans to stay in Cuba and make the Cuban leadership happy. Have a seat. Or you, or you want a world where you allow people who want to flee Cuba, flee and effectively tell the Cuban leadership, fuck you, you're not good and we want to flee your country. Have a seat. Next, they come on here and talk and tell what we don't understand this entire argument about how, on one hand, they want change in Cuba, but on one hand, they want normalization. It's effectively saying that whatever you've been doing for the past 40 years is okay and removing and remove all those sanctions is a legitimate thing to do. So move on, closing. All right, go. Um, maybe you should nuance your argumentation to the fact that no other country received the kind of preferential treatment. That's why it creates a singling out effect. Just because we have also asylum seekers on the outside of the house, doesn't mean it creates that particular preferential effect treatment. Can you actually nuance your arguments to that particular yeah. preference? If you listen to the vision sheet, if you listen to the vision speech, you will notice that we haven't invaded any other country with CIA-backed rebels, we haven't invaded any other country with, oh, yeah. with uh, defectors, and effectively fail the, the invasion, make sure that the totalitarian, totalitarian regime climbed down on them even more, yeah. effectively, know that have a seat, 
I definitely told that if you try to save me but we fail, that is why you are in this, this entire situation, that this entire predicament that you're in. This is no one coming out of kitchen speech. But even if you told us that your problem is single, we just expand this policy to any country, to all the countries, right? People want to come to America, can't come to America, we just make it easier for people in general for people to actually stay in America. And this is the second thing that they missed out from teachers speak, right? But how in Trump's administration is so much harder. So all your asylum policies, all your policies about making life easier for these individuals have a seat to have uh, to actually go to America and have to become permanent residents. All that doesn't exist because in Trump's world they are less likely to accept accept immigrants. They're less likely to they're more likely to make it harder for immigrants to apply for legal citizenship. Have a seat. Extreme vetting will occur. Things that are, a, lot of, a lot of things will happen that makes life for immigrants that much harder. They make the pathway for citizenship that much harder in your world. You cannot ignore that, right? So moving on to my positive contribution. Before that, Firstly, have a seat. Firstly, how is it a betrayal to Cuban families, right? Because you cannot ignore the fact that Cuba, as the have a seat, Cuba, as not only the site of a Bosch invasion, but also the country that hosts Russian missiles during the Cuba missile crisis, has an act has an active incident. So have a seat. This caused America to have an active incentive to depower the Cuban people. That's why they flooded the Cuban messages with the Cuban radio with CIA-backed propaganda, right? They told them that the regime is horrible. They promoted the American dream. They promised a lot of good things if they come to America. So, and they had a seat. And that is why a lot of people wanted to flee Cuba. A lot of people wanted to head to America in order to search for a better dream. Parents will tell their children, I'll go to America first, you grow up, we'll get enough money, then, then you'll come and join me for have a seat, have a reunion in America. Your world takes, a, takes away their promise. You care about Cuban families, you effectively lie to the individuals that say that you can come to America for an American dream, but your children cannot. What are you going to tell those people waiting on the shores of Miami? And suddenly, when their children arrive on the beaches, they will immediately sent back to Cuba, or even worse, be found on sea and get shot by the Coast Guard, because now you're effectively telling your, telling your immigration officers that you do not want refugees, and you are less and more hostile towards the Cuban, the Cuban immigrants. This adds another level of emotional harm towards the Cubans, because you're not only invaded their homeland and made the situation that much worse, but it also caused them to be unable to reunite with their families. Second argument, how does it reduce incentive to other socialist Latin America states to open up, right? Because in your world, you cannot ignore the fact that there are other leftist and Latin America states, like Venezuela, like Bolivia, and this policy, in effect, is a punishment by saying that if you go too far to the left, we are punishing with this policy. We will actively incentivize people to leave, we will drain you of your political capital, we will drain you, we will make you go to the brain trade. In your world, you remove that turret. It makes it that much less likely for individuals in your world, in Bolivia and Venezuela to flee, you make it less likely for these governments to open up, you make it less likely for these individuals to liberalize. We have failed the Cuban people once. Let's not, let's not do it again. Thank you very much for your speech. We invite the member of government to start the debate. Thank you. Thank Open House today has still not talked about the intricacies of the actual policy, why it was constructed, and why it is bad. Now, firstly, this policy is not meant for protection. It was, it was, it was constructed to accept less people, not more. It is inherently threatening to, a, to an asylum-seeking population and therefore oppressive. Now, let's move on to some rebuttals here. Uh, also, we heard from uh, opposition that we owe protection to the people. Uh, so that more people could leave Cuba. In, if the end outcome that they want is protection, then why only give protection to those who are capable of reaching land? That 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 is unfair. That uh, compa <coughs> uh, in the absence, the question that they must answer is that in the absence of it, uh, can they receive asylum? You have misrepresented this, what this debate is about: the policy and the harms it causes to people. It is a policy. Does it? Uh, since America currently accepts refugees, does this policy does, does this policy uh, call, does make it easier for refugees to come to America or so not? Uh, yeah, I think that. A path that guarantees fast track American citizenship is meant to deter refugees from going to America. Did I know that right? Sorry. A path that guarantees fast track American citizenship 
to skip past all these layers of bureaucracy is a meant to deter refugees from arriving. I didn't have discussion, so uh, but uh, let's uh, now go. Okay, uh, what what we what we bring to you is an analysis of how you put refugees in further danger. Uh, what we want to do is create uh, is is prove that this danger is far greater than Turkey. That the effects that these people undergo in order to reach land, in order to achieve asylum, in itself is extremely difficult and very dangerous. Now, uh, we they said that the, uh, we said that uh, that we, we in, in the process of achieving asylum. Uh, refugees must first encounter border guards and then encounter land. Now, uh, they put themselves in dangerous positions in order to escape from being yes, found out. No, thank you. Uh, these these methods in, the, in themselves are dangerous. They use shaky rafts that are capable of sinking. They, in order to achieve maximum stuff, they go out at night, in which they put themselves in further dangerous positions. Uh, in, uh, and also would accept uh, offers from shady, shady people about uh, who would in, in who would in effect exploit them further. Now the end outcome of what we are discussing is that oppressed people are oppressed more, that more dangerous, that they are put in more dangerous positions uh, in order to achieve asylum and that it causes a tangible human harm in that people are affected in order to achieve asylum. This, uh, <clears throat> Uh, in, in my second extension, I would like to talk about how uh, the United States must set uh, must set a precedent as being as having a moral high ground, and why this matters. Now, uh, US, the U.S. is seen as uh, uh, no, thank you. Uh, the U.S. is seen as uh, as having a moral high ground, and that most countries would set policies in view of what the United States said, in the fact that they are influenced by how the United States in itself views the population. Now, uh, in the, <clears throat> Okay. This policy, in effect, has been proved as malicious, and it is not a stand to uphold. The Obama administration set the direction for more humane policy, and for the remainder, could on that point, uh, no, thank you. And and for the remainder, could not backtrack on what they are on this particular policy. Uh, what happened had this policy not ended? Well, uh, in effect, it would be using symbolism. In, in in that America would could not hold a position as the could not hold a model high ground when it comes to refugee acceptance, and that it is one more step in the right direction. In that it would further no fact, in that it would further policy to low, to lessen human harm on refugees seeking asylum. Uh, which is the world that we would like to live in? Uh, because a moral stance is more tolerable. In that people would the, the perception of people would change in and and that policies uh, that for, that come from government it would would be far more progressive and uh, more tolerable morally. The, the outcomes for what the opposition uh, for what government has proposed sets the direction for less human harm and also is more morally tangible. Thank you. That's what, that's what I'm thinking, thank you. We thank the member of government for his speech. We thank the member of opposition who started the hearing process. Thank you. Thank you. I want to suggest that above and beyond the opening discussion that we've had, there's also a discussion on the, the discussion that we haven't had is on the refugee situation from Cuba to the US, and it's still happening. Like, and, and these are the, like questions that we need to ask of like what this policy specific, what's the role of this policy specifically in dealing with this refugee situation. Because so if you notice, this policy is about turning away certain groups of people and accepting a certain group of people. At this point, the which you land on American soil will accept you, but otherwise, if you're out at sea, we will like, send you away. So that's also a discussion that needs to be had. And we are going to, and, and we think like, okay, my, my argumentation is going to deal quite directly with CG, but before that, like, the, the qualm coming out from opening up is like on, on like the influence on, on, on Cuba that the US had. But is it really true that the economic influence is the only way or even like the best way to normalize relations with Cuba? We think that it's not true because if the characterization of Cuba that they want to bring 
us is that of Cuba being incredibly suspicious and like, unhappy with like US because of whatever they see as imperialism, then we don't understand why on their side Cuba was going to necessarily accept any form of involvement, whether it's economic or not. But moreover, even if it works, whatever they're talking about, in the in in this like, increase of influence, we don't think that you necessarily normalize relationships between the two countries. Because this way we distinguish between normalization of relationships uh, on, on a governmental or like fundamental level. Because when you make it much harder for Cubans to cross, they as individuals are going to see you as hostile and hypocritical because of how America wants to be a leader, you no know, thank you, but don't want to help you. Ultimately, we think that the people you are going to benefit is still going to be the people at the top or like something OG wanted to prevent in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that I want to do is when, that, is when OG talked about Trump using this to like shed a short his anti-immigration like sentiments. We, we argue that in the best or like worst case scenario, right, this is still going to happen regardless. But the question is, what's like a more important consideration about the intake of refugees that's going to happen anyway? And what's the role that this specific policy plays? Why would they still continue to celebrate the policy in the way that it mechanistically functions? I'm going to talk about five things in my speech. One, I'm going to talk about the necessity, you know, thank you, for this cutoff. Second, about like scarcity limiting your charity for like refugees. Three, on prioritizing who we take in. Four, on like compromise uh, on compounding the immigration delay. And five, on why it's important to change Cuba from within. And like these are these most of my argumentation is going to deal directly. Thank you with like closing government's arguments. So first, why is it a necessity? Uh, why is it a necessity that this policy has this kind of cutoff? We argue to you that regardless, in, in like whichever situation you're talking about, there is a lot of there are a lot of in, like refugees trying to, or like people from Cuba trying to come over to the U.S. in in a world where we have this kind of policy. Those who actually make it to the US soil, they get the benefits of what OO wanted to talk about. Because OO, if you, if you like, listen to your case, was, I'll take it a moment, was telling you about taking in, how taking in refugees is good. We agree with that, but we tell you that like, you need to understand who we take in and why specifically like having these kinds of regulations is a good thing, but closing. Aren't people likely to put themselves in more dangerous situations trying to make it to land without being caught? We think that people are going to put themselves in these situations anyway, and the reason is this: they are fleeing situations that in their country that make their life so problematic. I'm going to talk about the situations in their in their country later. We think that even though they might argue that this kind of cutoff is an arbitrary, but we say that it's still necessary because it's not a burden that the UN government is obligated to take in all refugees regardless. So there needs to be some sort of delineation of who we take in, and the reason is this: because scarcity limits your ability to be charitable towards refugees. In agreeing to take in refugees, you then need to allocate resources to enable this process. That means healthcare, like allocating land, even if like it's not giving them housing, you give them a place to at least like build tents or whatever. Then you need manpower in your administration to process all these things. Like on top of like, we argue that your goodwill towards refugees is limited at a point which you cannot afford to do so. Hence we need to have this policy as a means of regulating who comes in. There's a priority of resources that needs to happen. People who are on our ground, at least we prioritize this. This is the cutoff we're happy to defend. I want to suggest that en enabling social integration also requires resources that the US government cannot afford or waste. For example, you have to like, uh, like English classes or basic vocational skills, etc. etc. We don't think there's an obligation to spend taxpayers' dollars on every ref refugee who wants to come in. Because we argue that the comparative is this. When you end this policy, people are going like people from Cuba are just going to basically flood over. Because now there's no uh, on their side, there's just no uh, uh, like cut off. Everyone, as long as long as you want to come over, right, you can just come over. We argue there's going to be a flooding over of people. So why is prioritizing who we take in important? Because Cuba, right, their life might be hard in Cuba. Okay. Poverty, that's true, but life is significantly improving for them, especially with the easing of restrictions. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
But we still are, there's other refugees and lots of other asylum seekers who are in the process they wanted to talk about that you need to prioritize. And that's why we need this kind of cutoff. And so, at the point at which you need to make trade offs, we argue perhaps it's better to prioritize maybe the Syrian refugees over people in Cuba whose lives are just hard and are trying to escape all of that poverty and just escape to a better life in America. We argue that changing Cuba from within is perhaps the best. Like a benefit of like itself of, of this policy yeah. because then you change the decision making calculus of Cuba because they recognize there is a there is a big risk that they are taking because they need to reach the land uh, of, of like the US before they can act, like they can have all the benefits that OG want to talk about but you but on at least without like this policy you prevent unbridled ex exodus of people who are just trying to escape a hard life yeah. we think that forcing people to stay or like to increase their decision making uh, like risk for them actually means that these people end up not running away from the problem and building up the economy especially now that like there's a lot of easing of, of, of like restrictions economy can be built up we rather that people yeah. run away from the problem and we rather that they stay because of this we are very happy to oppose Coming from NUS debates, we like to say we know a lot about the question. <laughs> like, do you know what it's like debating with Nakia? In case perhaps she actually comes up to you and tells you, you will run what I tell you to run and you will like it. So that's the kind of profession we're talking about. <laughs> but to be honest, we really don't have any idea what it's like to live in an oppressive country. We can't possibly access the kind of degree of fear and of suffering and of loss yeah, yeah. and of grief for all of these refugees. But we know that there are people out there who do. They know what it's like to live in a repressive regime and feel for their lives every single day. And it's these people closing government to need to us. That's what this debate is really about. In the opening half, nobody wanted to talk about the specifics of what wet food, dry food really meant. These are the specifics, right? If you reach land, you survive. If you don't, you can't guarantee your survival. Point. You can't guarantee your safety. Your protection is not our responsibility. This is not a generic debate about America or Cuba or America-Cuba relations. Otherwise, the motion would be something along the lines of this house regrets US acceptance of Cuban refugees, or like this house supports the accept US acceptance of Cuban refugees. But the motion isn't worded like that. The motion requires us to deal with specifics. If you don't believe me, you can ask for the least research where I can. But okay, so now that we've clarified what this debate is really meant to be about, I think it's really time to question which side better protects the refugees than try desperately to reach the shore. Because we think that the bulk of um, government, sorry, opposition's analysis missed the intricacies of the wet food, dry food policy. Opening, uh, opening opposition can be cultured to us as a policy for protection. In the case, if it's for protection, why do we want to make a distinction between who we are willing to protect and who we are not? Because the fact of their policy is this. If you don't make it to shore, you don't deserve protection. That's what they're putting you today. Don't let them get away with lying to you about protection. Yeah, okay. But you listen. So, if you're willing to die, to reunite with your families, or to leave Cuba for the American dream, it shows how much these people need to, need to reach American shores. What are you doing for them in closing government? Um, I think that there's this presumption here that in the absence of wet food, dry food, we wouldn't be accepting any refugees oh, at all. We don't think that that's no. the case. In fact, we think that that's the site that's willing to let all these people die. Again, it's they're trying to tell you lies. But okay, let's go on. Rama gave you pumps about you know like what actually happens about the wet food or when you, you have the wet food, dry food policy in place. He told you that the US constructed this policy in order to first disincentivize Cuban people from entering from trying to make it through America, right? Because the fact of the matter is basically this that if you get caught on sea, you get like sent back to Cuba or you get sent to another country. 
there's a lot of uncertainty. You can't predict the future, whether your life would be better in the future. But more uniquely, they gave us an extension, and this was analyzed by Rama, never really responded to within able speech. Rama came up here to tell you that, that people put themselves in extremely precarious situations in order to avoid being caught. So they are more likely to take the dangerous routes. They are more likely to travel at night because there's less visibility. They don't have to worry about coast guards exposing them and sending them back. They are more likely to go to America on rickety boats because these boats are smaller and therefore they are less visible. These are all the kind of harms and dangers we are talking about on our side of the house never really responded to. In fact, we think that Abel's response to this was particularly flippant. He told you it's dangerous anyway. In that case, why would we want to make it more dangerous for these people to enter the US? We never really heard a response to that. No thank you. But okay, so those were those were, were the, all the unique extensions that closing government, uh, closing government gave you in this debate. Let's talk about what Abel wanted to talk about. He told you about scarcity, like scarcity, and how dare they masquerade U.S. selfishness as scarcity in this scenario? Because we we have this American exchange student, and I can tell you. <laughs> Abundance, like prosperity. Like just looking at him, you know that America doesn't really suffer from that issue, a scarcity issue. But we tell you that America definitely has the resources to provide for all these refugees anyway. And even if these resources are tied up in other areas, we think it's important for us to free them up in order to protect human life. Ultimately, I think in closing our opposition, they really showed us that they don't care about human life at all. They, they are willing to divert resources from other areas in order to protect human life. But if we really wanted to engage with them on this point of scarcity, That's and we right. really admitted to this point of scarcity, we think and we question why is the cut off made at the point of land versus sea? Because the unique distinction there, we think that scarcity is an issue that can be addressed through other areas. But land versus sea is unique insofar as it puts people in even more danger than they would have ever experienced if we made the cut off at any That's other right. point. They never show they never shown us why. Wet foot, dry foot is a method and a unique mechanism through which we can best deal with the issue of yeah. scarcity. Finally, the Abel Bakwas' idea of people now flooding over to the United States. I'm going to use Abel's own logic against him. So he told us it was dangerous to travel anyway. Let me tell you, it's also dangerous to travel anyway. Like, we don't get why that's going to be. Like, we don't get why their side accepts all the That's benefits right. for their side, but doesn't allow us, isn't that char uh, charitable towards us. In any case, we think that in the, if the people fly over to the United States, that's a situation we're happy to accept if it means that we are better able to protect people. Never really had a response to any of these points. Finally, unique extension from Rama, um, Abel dropped it. I hope Mingling is able, uh, able to be a it. So we told you about humane foreign policy, right? The whole issue of repealing wet food, dry food is that it sets the direction for more humane foreign policy. Because we have to question, what would the world look like if the Obama administration didn't make clear that it valued human life above things like, you know, people getting to eat a lot. It valued human life over things like, you know, financial resources. We think that the, the wet food, dry food policy, uh, the repeal of the wet food, dry food policy set the direction for the US to move towards more humane foreign policy in all the areas to prove that it valued human life. We, tell you, we told you about the spillover effects on other countries' foreign policy. Again, uh, analysis that came out in Rama's speech never dealt with in April. So we give you all this analysis on how our world is a better one to live. The truth is that we don't end suffering with the Obama. We didn't end suffering when the Obama administration repealed Red Food Society. But we collectively took a step towards a more humane world. There can be no reason to regret this step. Thank you, Kathy, for my speech. Now we invite the opposition bid to end the debate today. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So Ati sounded really nice. She portrayed you an amazing picture of how Cuban lives really suck. But what she, under, what she does not understand is that the Cuban situation is fundamentally different from any kind of refugee situation 
around the world. We're not talking about people who are escaping places like Syria, for example, like North Korea, where they will actually die in the next minute, possibly. We're talking about Cuban refugees. Cuban people who leave their soil and go towards America for a better life. It's not because they're going to die, but because they think that they have a better chance okay. of enriching their lives in American soil. That's the fundamental difference. Therefore, you cannot buy into a sob story because it really doesn't make sense. That's why Abel Poe even characterized what life is like for Cuban people and what the motivations for them leaving the country in the first place. The moment you don't understand why they are leaving, it's not because they're going to die, but rather because they want to improve their situation. There's no way in which you can really truly understand how you want to best help them and best help the Cuban economy. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about two things today. Firstly, who normalizes relationship with Cuba better and that will be directly what opening government was trying to talk about. Secondly, who better improves the lives of Cubans and that's when I'll deal with CJ's entire argument about how people are going to die even faster. First idea, who actually normalizes relationship with Cuba? What we heard from opening government is the idea about how like, economic influence is the best way forward, we're going to help them, we're going to enrich their lives. Abel already told you that that's not true at the point in which your characterization is that you're entirely suspicious of Western imperialism. Yeah. At the point in which you think that Western imperialism or US influence is going to harm your soul or harm your economy, then we think that like neocolonialism, right, your economy is going to be the way in which US controls your politics, for example. That's when they're likely to reject you. And given that the OG's entire case is premised upon the idea that you want an economic influence through normalization of relationship, we think then the entire case false. But Abel also told you that even if it works, it only increases like the influence in terms of the governmental level, but not the people. And that's why he brought to you this unique distinction between the normalization amongst people like government to government and like government to people. Yeah. Why is this important? Because you think that if you're only going to normalize relationship on the governmental level, then it buys into their problem that they're trying to solve at a point in which you don't actually help the people on the ground. But more importantly, and that's what Abel told you about why the delicate balance between the wet food drive is so important, right? Because we also achieve the delicate balance between the relationship of US and Cuban government as well as US and Cuban people. Why? The cut off balances US promise of duty of care to the Cuban people because when they reach their land, we promise we'll protect you. At the same time, they compromise with the US and Cuban government's relationship because we tell them that, you know, if your people don't reach our land, and then sure, you take them back, you respect your autonomy in that sense. We think in that case, the Red Food Drive for Policy is a perfect balance or delicate relationship between the government, like the US duty of care towards the Cuban people, so, no sense you, and the Cuban, like the US duty of care, or like the US relationship with the Cuban government. That's the fundamental delicate balance that they really never once understood on like side over the government. But then the question is, how do we then change or how do we then enact the kind of normalization of relationship if everyone in this debate thinks it's so important? Look, we have to recognize that we have to buy hearts and minds at a point in which you want to change or normalize the relationship between the US people and between the Cuban people. When you give people confidence, no thank you, and the ability to uplift themselves because you tell them, look, you reach my land, I help you improve the economy, and then you can go back and do things for your country. We think that you buy the hearts and minds of people because they recognize and identify what the US is trying to sell to them. Okay. No thank you. And then we think they're likely to improve relationships and furthermore, you give them the money, you give yeah. them with the ability to go back and help their country. No thank you. Then the question comes, why won't the Cuban government just crush their rent? Because of numbers. When you accept a lot of people to your country, right, you have the support of numbers. Okay, the support of numbers is increasingly difficult for the Cuban government to actually like, just crush you entirely. But more importantly, then they say, um, these people are just take the US and not actually return to Cuba. That's not true because you cannot bring an entire family over at the point in which they characterize in both of like opening and closing governments that people are fragile and weak. No sense. <laughs> that means at the point in which your family is left in Cuba, yeah, yeah. you have an intrinsic incentive to then go back when you're able to and help uplift your country. This yeah. means that you A, equip people with the ability to do so, but B, no thank you, you incentivize them with the ability or motivation to go back and help their people. That's how you improve the kind of normalization of relationship between in terms of the values of the Cuban people and the US people, no thank you. But more importantly, you allow them to enact change from within. That's something that may never once achieve on opening government. Therefore, we think in terms of this clash, we already take this big. No thank you. Let's move on to the second idea. That's why I do it like CDs. Um, argument about how people are going to die worse. Who better improves the life of Cubans? What do you hear from Rama? He told us that people will try to cross more dangerously and in the process they'll die. Look, this assumes right, that they are going to cross anyway in the first place. Why is this not true? We 
think the idea of they will cross anyway was that it was premised upon them saying that, oh yeah, my life really sucks, <coughs> yeah, therefore I have to move. No, at a point which Abel tells you that they are moving because of economic incentives, because they want to enrich their lives, we think that the, like, the decision making calculus of okay. an individual is fundamentally different. But before that, go. Um, your member says that Trump will restrict immigration policy anyway, but isn't that a little bit of a simplistic response to a one-of-a-kind fast-track citizenship program for illegal immigrants from Cuba? Why would Trump use this as justification to send the Coast Guard to sink boats carrying refugees and be more aggressive when it comes to these particular things? This response to both of you guys. Okay. If the Trump administration right, is really so fucked up, right, they are going to be yeah. fucked up anyway. But we think this policy is unique because it allows people to capitalize on it and see that the US is ultimately upholding its promise of duty of care to the Cuban people. So moving on. So that assumes on the anti side, right? People will want to cross. But the point which you recognize that it's because of economic incentives, then they have to weigh out. Do I really want to make the dangerous situation and cross the sea? Or do I just really want to try to improve my life because my family sends me back money or the people that manage to cross send back money? You think that changes the decision making calculus of people. Then they challenge us, right? Why why land and why sea? That's problematic. We really dealt with it in terms of balancing the delicate relationship between US government and the Cuban government. More importantly, we think when you incentivize people to try, like, like you this suggest people to try and cross because you can't you could possibly die in the sea, there's no guarantee. We think that you allow people to want to enact change as far as possible on their side instead of just escaping to another land in the first place. Therefore, it's comparatively better to incentivize Cuban people to enact change on their own soil. But more importantly, we think Abel's extension is extremely important because the scarcity of resources is actually true. You cannot tell me that Raymond is very rich, therefore America will have like infinite amount of resources. We think ultimately, scarcity is a real problem. You cannot give people an illusion of hope and tell them to come over to your country that you cannot actually provide them with anything substantial, like because you have so many refugees, so many people to take care of, scarcity is a real thing. For all these reasons, extremely proud to stand in closing opposition. I don't think it's you, I thought it's better you are.